hundred C.
Thank the Lord for America. Amen. America has, for over 200 years, has stood for freedom for the entire world. Not just for ourselves, but we have been the promoters of freedom to people that have been in bondage in many different ways. We thank God for America. I was reading a little bit about Memorial Day. I told you I wasn't myself quite myself this morning. Of course, I might be myself. This may be the new me. You never know. Uh, thank you. Memorial, uh, so there's some things we need to remember, and that's really what it means is remember these things. Uh, we need to remember, of course, our fallen soldiers, and we need to remember the things the Lord has called us to. Uh, Life is not always easy, war is never easy, and it's never fair. The we go. See if that'll work now. We have to remember. There are some things that are very, very important to remember. One of the things that Memorial Day, the main thing it's supposed to help us do is to remember how, that people die in war. I did not look up the death count. The, uh, what we talk about in Memorial Day did not start out as Memorial Day. It started out as Decoration Day. Let me see if I can find some of those dates and times. Uh, I can tell you that I feel like uh, Ralph Emerson. Oh no, what was what was Ralph Waldo Emerson? I feel like him at the last of his life. He got to where he couldn't uh, remember a lot of words. And one of the things that he could, just could not remember, one of the words he had trouble with was the word plow, P-L-O-W. And he would be talking uh, about a plow, and he would say, that thing that you use to break up the earth so you can plant a garden, because he couldn't remember the word plow. He could remember all the other big stuff about it, but he couldn't get that one particular word out. He had a hard time remembering names as well. And uh, that come up in the last of his life. And I forget what he called his, his memory. He called it his naughty memory. It was naughty. Well, in that time, N-A-U-G-H, or however you spell it, T-Y, it didn't mean immoral. It, it meant not working properly. And uh, it has, since the uprise of pornography, it has become... A talk about him, a word about him, immorality. But Memorial Day used to be known as Decoration Day. And when I was a kid, it, we called it Decoration Day, maybe because all the old people knew it that way. I don't remember when, uh, maybe we'll look at it in a minute, uh, somewhere in the 70s, maybe when it was changed to the uh, Memorial Day. But it's a day when family and friends would honor those who died serving their country by decorating their graves with flowers. And I'm going to ask just the young people, not the adults, but do you remember or do you know what kind of flowers they normally put on the graves? Does anybody remember? All right, you're afraid to tell me? All right, how about adults? Poppies. Yeah, poppies. I don't know if that's still a big thing today or not. I really don't. I know the church that I went to put a flag on Decoration Day on every veteran, that, everyone who had died in war. I mean, the, the people that had the, it was a pretty good-sized cemetery, not huge to the, today's standards, 
but a pretty good-sized cemetery, and they'd bring that book out, and they would say, here, put one here, and they should put one there. And they would look through, because they had all of the records of those people that was given, and, uh, and if they were, veter if they were uh, killed in war, then they would put a flag out. And once they had done all of that, then the preacher would read some scripture, somebody would pray, and we'd miss Sunday school. That was my best reason for Decoration Day. I hate to say it, I was a bad kid. And uh, we missed Sunday school, and then we had to go in and hear preaching. I wasn't saved yet, all right? And, uh, and I was kind of a bad kid. Uh, but anyway, they put poppies. Uh, it would take almost a century for the celebration officially to be renamed by the government. Secondly, we have someone to thank for the holiday. And I put that in there. I, I, I looked on a lot of different things over the Internet. I looked up some of my records of what I've preached on and said during the Memorial Days. And, uh, but this one kind of stood out to me, that we have someone to thank for the holiday. You know, had there not been the individual, and he was a general, but had this general not taken the initiative to start Decoration Day, then it may have never gotten started. And there are several reasons why it may have not get, uh, gotten started. And we'll look at one of the next to the last thing that I tell you about uh, Memorial or Decoration Day. Uh, but that person was General John A. Logan. I was trying to remember if he's the same one that wrote uh, Ben-Hur. And I don't remember. Oh, it was Lou Wallace that wrote Ben-Hur. All right, thank you. I, I saw, saw a head go no, and I remember it was Lou Wallace. But anyway, he's commander-in-chief of the Union's Veterans Group, known as the Grand Army of the Republic. And he decreed that May 30th should become a nationwide day of uh, commem commemoration for the soldiers killed in the recently ended Civil War. He chose May 30th because it was a rare day that there was no... Uh, great anniversary of a Civil War battle on May 30th. Uh, there were so many anniversaries around the country of great battles and death and everything else that uh, he finally found May 30th as a day that uh, there wasn't anything being commemorated uh, about the Civil War. And of course that changed uh, to the Monday, the last Monday of the month, uh, and a, a, a hundred years I think from when it started. One of the earliest Memorial Day celebrations was held by freed slaves. In uh, North Carolina, and Charleston it is, uh, many of the northern troops that were captured were put in a prisoner of war camp in North Carolina. I don't remember what that uh, camp had been before. I, it's not in my notes. I didn't put it in there. But it, it wasn't made for as many people as they shoved in to that prisoner of war camp. And because there were so many there, there were uh, more than 250 prisoners that died from disease and exposure. Just a week after the surrender, 1,000 recently freed slaves, along with members of the U.S. colored troops and some of the city civilian gathered to the property, buried the soldiers uh, properly that had died in that prisoner of war camp, singing hymns, giving readings, and honoring the fallen dead. I think that's the first time I remember reading that about the fallen soldiers. And uh, if I had, I had read it before, I had forgotten it, that the uh, colored troops that recently freed uh, slaves had uh, had buried these northern soldiers. Most northern states celebrated Memorial Day by the 1890s. The South didn't adopt uh, the May 30th Memorial Day till after World War I. There was still so much friction, and, and I understand why there was so much friction. You had the carpetbaggers, Everything, you know, the president said, let's get rid of the bitterness, as uh, Lincoln did. Let's get rid of the strife and everything else. Let's be one nation, but it wasn't that way. 
I, every now and then I see a bumper sticker or something on the back window that says, the South will rise again. I think now it's just not a joke, but I think they know that it's not going to be another split in the nation like that, and especially not for that reason. But they didn't adopt it until after World War I, uh, by which time the, person, uh, the purpose had been broadened to include those who died in all of our country's war. The South refused to accept it until they said it's not about the Civil War, it's about every war that had ever been fought in this country. And then the South began to accept it. One, two states, three states, five, begin to uh, have that as their, uh, their uh, day of honor. And it was for all soldiers, even for the Southern soldiers. Uh, of course, in 1971, the Monday holiday was shifted uh, to m from Memorial Day on the 30th to the Monday day, uh, the last Monday of the month. One of the articles I read said it's a law that you have to celebrate Memorial Day because Congress, the House and the Senate both passed it. But technically, it's only a law that the government and government jobs celebrate Memorial Day. But I think everyone should. Memorial Day has come to mean more about other things than it has about remembering our fallen soldiers. Uh, the flag is supposed to fly at half staff until noon. If you have a flag that it raises up and goes down, then it's supposed to fly at half staff. The flag is to be raised all of the way to be brought back down and raised half of the way and stay until noon uh, because it's so important that we remember. And it's important that our children coming up remember that people die for freedom. And, and there have been, the Civil War was the greatest battle and the greatest loss of lives through the Civil War, I think, than any other war. And it was a terrible tragedy. It was brother against brother and families against families, the North against the South. Uh, some churches got involved in taking sides, which side they should fight for. And it was a terrible thing that happened here in the United States. It was a terrible thing because, and, and I really don't believe slavery was the reason the Civil War started. Okay? You have to read a lot of history. But when the South held their own, the North, put, uh, our pre the President Lincoln, started pushing slavery. And that was the reason. And in doing so, some of the foreign countries that were selling goods and weapons to the South quit selling it because it became a slavery issue. And it made it harder for the South to receive goods to fight the battles. But it is a civil rights or a slavery issue from that point on. Uh, slavery should have never happened. It should not have been a, a part of history, but it is a part of history. And we have to move on from that point. And it's been a whole lot of years uh, from the 1860s until now that, that battles, those battles have been over. But the civil rights battles continue. Memorial Day is about remembering. There are three words or three phrases that I want to give you, and I couldn't think of any more, but I remember the Alamo. Remember the Alamo. Does anybody know what the Alamo was about? Okay. Yeah. yeah. The Mexican government had allowed Texans to come in, said you can, uh, you can rule over yourselves, you can have the land, you can do all of this. And then all of a sudden they, uh, there was a change in politics and they said you can't have it. You've got to do what we say. And then, of course, the, the fight began. And at the Alamo was where people like Davy Crockett and Daniel Bo uh, Boone, I don't remember how many of the other famous people there was, but died there. And they said, remember the Alamo. When they come to fight, they said, remember the Alamo. Then it was remember the Maine. The Maine was a ship uh, that was sunk. And it was remember the Maine. And they told them, you have to remember the Maine and because that'll make you, that would make them fight better. Remember Pearl Harbor was another one. And when Pearl Harbor took place, my uncle told me that he was ashamed that the military wouldn't take him. 
He was tall, he was healthy, but he had flat feet. And they wouldn't take him. He tried, to, he tried the Army, he tried the Air, uh, Air Corps, the, uh, he tried the Marines, the Navy. They wouldn't take him. Finally, they went to California and worked building ships and things in California. Uh, the whole family did. My grand, grandparents, my aunts and uncles, my mother, they all went out there, got jobs. Well, my mother didn't. She was still in school. And they worked in the defense uh, of our country. And boy, they needed pilots and they needed co-pilots uh, on the ships, not airplanes. Uh, they needed the people to run those things. And they came to him one day and uh, said, we see you've applied. And why wouldn't they take you? And he said, flat feet said, you'll do good in the merchant marines. Merchant marines were those that took supplies to the soldiers. And so my uncle, he said, my heart was lifted up because now I could go and defend my country. He said, a man that was not in service or working for the service in some way, everyone considered them derelicts, not doing their job, not doing what they were supposed to do. He said, it was time to fight the enemy. And that's a, that's a thing that we don't have today. I wish we had it. Our wars would be a whole lot shorter if we could go in and fight battles like it was a real war. But here we need to remember. We need to remember our fallen soldiers. Number one, it reminds us, again, the cost of the battles. It's actual human life. We begin to call it human treasure. It's our greatest treasure. And we call all of those who died, for whatever way or how they died, we call them our American heroes. And around the world, in Germany, they do the same thing. At least when I was in Germany looking for an apartment, I had somebody taking me around to show me apartments, and every door I went into, they would show us their fallen soldiers. They were proud of them. They weren't necessarily proud of Adolf Hitler and a lot of other things, but they were proud of their families. And we should be proud of those that went, and sad to say, those that died. And you know when you go that could happen. You, you, you don't have to be out on the field for it to happen. They could, they could launch a mortar or anything into the company area and the captain can be killed and he'd never been in combat. You know you could die when, you, when you're in the service. And you, you put that in your heart and you put that in your mind. It's to remind us the cost. And it's to remind us of the importance of our military. To keep America and the rest of the world as much as we can free from tyranny, from communism, from socialism, from all of those things that are trying to take over around the world. And it's a sad, sad day. I did watch one of the preachers a little bit longer than normal today because he was talking about the Jewish people and how they remember. I don't remember the name of the building that they've built, but all of their soldiers, men and women, and in Israel, every man and every woman has to be in the service. They have to be. Now, there are religious exemptions, health exemptions, and a few things like that. But everybody that is capable, they go into military service. And after their training, when they swear in their final oath, they go to the Holocaust Museum. And they go through and see all that was taken place. And they're told to remember. Remember. Never forget. To forget is to allow it to happen again. Never forget. And then he told that during this, all that was going on with Hitler and in Germany, that Luther wrote a pamphlet that said in that pamphlet that all Jews should have their tongue cut out from the back of their neck, which means dismemberment, chop their head off. I've not seen, I've never, I've never been heard that before. And said Luther, uh, Hitler had that particular pamphlet reprinted when they went into Poland and passed it out to all the people. It's not just our soldiers. 
The Jewish people have died for their freedom. Millions at a time. It's sad. Terrible sad. I've mentioned Ralph uh, Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said, how many times have I said, I forgot what I was talking about. And sure enough, we do that. Our fallen soldiers, what a price they paid. We need to remember them. But we need to remember more than just our fallen soldiers. Joshua chapter 4, let's read the first few verses. There's memorials that we need to have in our lives. In Joshua chapter 4, And it came to pass, when all the people were clean past over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people and out of every tribe, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place, where ye shall lodge this night. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing upon your word, and we pray that you'll speak to our heart. Meet every need as only you can do in Jesus' name. Amen. We find that the children of Israel, Israel had come out of 40 years of wilderness wandering, out of a, several hundred years in the land of Egypt as slaves, and they're now getting ready to cross over into the land of promise. And as they get ready to cross over, verse 17 says, And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, this is chapter 3, the last verse of chapter 3, And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and on the dry ground until uh, all uh, the people were passed clean over Jordan. When the priest carrying the ark of the covenant started in, the water separated. And they stood in the midst basically the middle, and told the people to walk on a cross. I personally believe there were three and one half million Jews that crossed there. I've heard as low as 350,000. Uh, because of the death rate, you know, everybody 40 and older had to die. Some believe that they didn't increase, that uh, all of the adults had to be taken off of that count. But however many there were, as they went across, out of the 12 tribes, when they got on the other side, God told Joshua, said, uh, here's what you're to do. You get your 12 men, one out of each tribe, and you go back where the priests are. And you pick up some rocks. And uh, it doesn't say rocks, but it says stone, I believe. And uh, let's see if I can find it there. Verse 3, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you. And so they sent twelve people in to grab stones. I imagine they grabbed the biggest stone they can carry. I don't know. There may have only been twelve stones there. God may have provided them already. I know when the altar was to be built, they weren't to put hammers on the altar or chisels, it was to be just those stones that they gathered that to put down. It doesn't say that about this. I don't, don't remember it saying about here. But whatever, they got those stones and they carried them across all the way over. Then in verse number four, then Joshua called the 12 men who had prepared the, uh, of the children of Israel, one out of every tribe. Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark, the Lord your God, in the midst of the Jordan, and take ye up a man, uh, every, uh, every man of you a stone uh, uh, upon his shoulder, according as the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What meaneth by ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so as the Lord commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan, as the Lord spake unto Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them to the place where they lodged, in other words, where they was going to spend the night, and laid them down there. 
And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priest which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there until this day. We find that God made this as a memorial to remember, uh, just like Memorial Day, the last part of verse 7, for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. We have a responsibility to pass on to our children these things spiritual things, and even uh, human things, family matters, uh, talking about your great-great-grandparents that you know about. You need to pass that on uh, from one to the other. Events that happen in your life, events that drew your family closer together, the difficulties that God has helped you through so that the children, the generation to come, might know, hey, this is something we need to think about. Just like the fallen soldiers that we memorialize tomorrow, technically, that we remember that they gave their lives, it should encourage our young people to think about military service. I know it's tough, and I know it's dangerous, and I know it doesn't pay a lot of money, but I also know that there's great reward in following in a military manner and many families do. Boy, and sometimes it helps because the young ones, the children, the grandchildren, they can go into service having the verbal experience of their parents or their grandparents. And boy, those that are excited about it, they'll be encouraged by reading about it, by hearing about it. And it's important that you're patriotic enough to just consider military service. I believe it's something that everyone needs to think about. Turn to the book of Hebrews, and we're going to finish in just a couple of minutes. Hebrews chapter number 11, <clears throat> verse number 29. We've talked about our American men who died in service, and it wasn't always American men. There were people who came and were in service in order to become citizens, who died before they became citizens. Some became citizens posthumously after they died. They, the people that were helping them contacted the officials and said they died in military service. And they made them uh, technical citizens of this country. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29, I'm going to read here where it says, They passed over through the Red Sea, as on dry ground, with the Egyptians assayed to come, were drowned. Now, this is not the, uh, uh, every passage that we talk about them leaving is not the Red Sea. Some is when they're going into Israel and some when they're coming out of Egypt. But here it says, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab perished, not with them uh, that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. Uh, the, uh, perish not. I, I said perish, but I didn't get the word not in there. So perish not when she had received the spies with peace. Uh, we see how God is blessing uh, Rahab. And uh, I didn't bring my notes. I didn't believe I'd be preaching, and I won't on her. But if you follow Rahab all the way through, she is a great, 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 I don't know how many times, uh, grandmother of our Lord Jesus Christ. She was a part of the family. God not only blessed her and she perished not there, but because she believed, she became a part of the family. It amazes me the grace of God. And we need to remember that God forgives sin. She was a wicked person. You say, well, she was a harlot. Yes, she was a harlot. That's a wicked person. A whoremongerer is a wicked person. The men that are that away, a woman that's that away, they're wicked people. God says so. And the Bible says they'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. And yet, she gets saved. Of course, anybody that gets saved is no longer what they were. And God take, accepts her into the family. It goes on, verse 32, says we can talk about Gideon and all the rest. Verse 33, about the, those that through faith subdued kingdoms. Uh, verse 34, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Verse 35, women received their 
uh, they're dead, raised to life again. Verse number 36, and others. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, yet moreover the bonds of imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they, uh, they were tempted, they were slain with a sword. That's verse 37. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Hey, now these are some of the same people, same family, God's children who live for God, and because they live for God, there were the others that didn't receive what the others received. Just because you're a Christian, it doesn't mean you're going to get everything that another Christian gets. Go to war, one dies, and 50, 100, or 500, or 1,000 don't. It sometimes hits one and misses the other or the whole bunch of others. And God didn't say we would be exempt from any of it. Verse number 38, of whom the world was not worthy. We talk about heroes today, and we call all American servicemen heroes, and I think that's overdoing it. I do. I remember when a young man, oh my, he's a preacher up in Kentucky now, but he was a youth pastor. I was helping another man with doing some work, and uh, this guy was working there as well. And he said, I heard your dad was in the war. And I said, yeah, he was in the war. Did he get any medals? And I said, well, he had you know, three bronze stars and various ribbons and accommodations. He said, your dad was a hero. And I never thought about dad being a hero because dad wouldn't talk about it. Dad died not much longer uh, after that. And uh, maybe he died had passed just before that. But he's always a hero to me because he was dad. But I didn't know how many battles he was in. He never told us about one. He didn't die in the war, and I'm thankful for that because he wasn't saved. He died of a couple of, uh, well, about 12, 13 years after he got saved. But not everybody's a hero. We thank them for serving, and boy, and what a blessing that is. But to me, a hero goes beyond what many do. Here we find that the world is not worthy of the Christians who have given their lives in order to get the gospel out. That's what these people here did. Verse number 38, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and the caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better things for us, that they without us should not be made perfect, complete. They're not complete without us. Those who died, who served God in that day, and just like many who die today, in one of the prayer letters, I think I mentioned it, there were three to be baptized, and yet there were so many hardships for them to overcome before they can be baptized. They could be put to death in their country for being baptized. And they have to make sure that it's done in such a way. Now, they're not going to deny their Lord, but they're going to wait on their baptism. Around the world, sometimes missionaries die for taking the gospel. There are heroes. Sometimes, even in this country, I don't know how many years back it was, but a young Arabic girl trusted the Lord as her Savior, told her parents she would not give it up, and the father killed her by cutting her head off in this country. And you know what our liberal, political, and legal leaders said? Well, they, they're doing what they would do in their country. That's what they'd have done there, but they're not in their country. If they're coming here, they'd better put that down and not, not come here or put it down and not do anything like that. You can be a hero without dying. You can do many heroic things. The Apostle Paul said he wanted to die in order to be a part of the resurrection. And he finally did. And he died the death I believe the Lord had for him. One day all of us will die. Are you ready to meet the Lord? Have you been saved? Have you been born again? 
Is Christ in your life? Well, I was trying to remember. Lewis uh, wrote a lot of Christian books. I'll be honest, his theology books were so deep that I did not understand most of them. He was that kind of an educated, deep, deep thinker. But he went on and said this, that those who do not need salvation, who think they do not need salvation, don't realize that none of us are worthy of salvation. That it's all the grace of God. I may have twisted his quote just a little bit. I didn't bring it with me. C.S. Lewis, a great author. This morning, are you God's child? You say, well, I don't need it. You just think you don't need it. You say, I'm a pretty good person. That doesn't count. Have you been born again? The only thing that counts. Was there a time in your life when you asked Jesus to come into your heart and life and save you? If you did sincerely, you know what happened? He saved you. You may doubt it from time to time. It may bother you every now and then. But you remember the rock you're standing on will not move, and that's Jesus. And he said, I will in no wise cast them out. Let's bow our heads for prayer.